Before we start, just a reminder that um, in one week, the uh, uh, final report of the project is due. Um, so it's, um, so uh, um, from reading your, um, from your, from reading your intermediate reports, it seemed like most of you were actually pretty far along and um, you shouldn't have had trouble finishing. Um, so um, a small number of you, I made a note that the, the writing on the, on the, on the, um, on the intermediate report, um, the, the style of writing and the language, maybe you need to be a little bit more careful with on the final report. Um, make sure you explain the data in the charts, not just put it in the charts. Um, so those are kind of things to uh, be careful about in the final report. But um, it's, it seemed like most of you were, um, were definitely on track. Um, so it's I'll, I get, I'll talk about a little bit more in detail on Wednesday, um, but um, keep in mind it's four pages per person, um, and you don't have to write that much, and you don't have to make the font tiny and try and cram as much in there as you can. Um, so, but um, but that's an upper bound. Um, you can put more in an appendix if you want to, but I will you know I I, I will plan to give you the grade based on what's in the, in the in the first four pages per student, not what's in the appendix, but I might look if I'm curious or something. Um, um, so just keep that in mind, and I'll t talk about that more um, on, on Wednesday. Um, so if you have any if you have any questions of, um, about the report, please uh, uh, look at it, and uh, and then come ready with questions on Wednesday, in case I don't. Um, Kind of uh, answer them as I'm going over that in more detail. So the last homework assignment is due after the last day of class. I kind of pushed it back so you can focus because you probably are taking other classes and they all have uh, maybe other projects or 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 tests or something. And it's due, I think, in the finals period. Uh, Maybe I'm not supposed to do, but as as a return, I'm going to make the last homework assignment so it's it's optional. If you don't do it, it won't be averaged into your grade. Still, the homeworks will make up 50% of the grade, but this one won't be averaged in. But this one will be. I'll try to make this one simple and a uh, chance for some bonus points. So you can, if if you want to, if you didn't do as well on the earlier one, you can actually make up points by doing this. Um, so it will be like a full bonus homework then? Well, it won't be a full bonus, so it'll be it'll be worth 10 points, but you'll get up to 20 points. Oh, okay. So it'll be something like that. So I, if, you, if you kept track of how many points all the homeworks have had so far, they will have 90 points up to before that. Right? And so if and so if you do that one, then there'll be 100 points total, but you can get 20 points on the last one. Okay. But if you only do the first, uh, five homeworks, you have 90 points, I'll scale that up. I'll multiply that by whatever it's supposed so to be. So that's the mark of 10 homeworks? Yeah. Okay. So it should also be, there'll be some analysis and some stuff in math. Uh, uh, so although I guess you could, you could probably do it in some other language. Or, yes, you can definitely do it in Octave or any language that you can do with matrices, but it's, you know, it should be fairly straightforward. Um, okay, so today we'll talk about um, outliers, um, and so um, so something um, that's maybe uh, um, fun to think about is um, outliers um, are um, are the cause of and the um, solution to um, all problems in data mining. <laughs> um, so what does this mean? So, um, so if, if, you look, if you look at a lot of data, if, if there are no outliers, you know, in any sense of the word, then and you try to model this by the line, then all the data would lie basically just on the line. And it's going to be very easy to find this line. You just 
take any two points and draw the line between them, and that's going to go through the other points too. It's going to be very easy, very trivial. So um, anything that you know, any non-trivial problem is because your data does not exactly fit um, the model, whatever you're trying to find, the structure you're trying to find. And so when people have trouble finding the structure, they're going to blame it because you have some sort of outlier. So you say, well, if I could get rid of the outliers, then the problem would be easy, right? And so, you know, in general, this is true if you can get rid of all the outliers, but probably more likely if you could replace the outliers with where they were supposed to be. Now, again, of course, there's no way of really knowing where this outlier was supposed to be. Was it supposed to be here? Was it supposed to be here? Down here? Was it not supposed to exist at all? You know, I'm not sure, right? So if you could get rid of them, it would solve everything. So it's it's a so it's you know it's a solution if you could get rid of them, but it's not really going to solve them. So, um, but um, so 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 you know dealing with outliers. Is, is an important topic because it really affects everything that's going on. Um, but there's not really the, the, there's not really a single best way how to actually deal with them. Um, and there's not like some magic you can just sprinkle on top of your data mining algorithm and it automatically solves things by dealing with outliers either. Um, but again, it's but what's really important to take away is to keep in mind and to think about outliers and how these could be affecting your, your algorithm, how they are affecting your analysis, and keeping this in mind. So when you're, when you're thinking about what your data set could be, you'd say, if I have a million points or you know, um, a thousand points, what happens if I put in one outlier? Is this going to totally break the algorithm? To kind of run through these thoughts in your head when you're um, trying to design these things. For instance, like the um, like the Gonzalez algorithm for clustering. If you put one outlier in this data set, it's going to be one of your cluster centers. You're going to pick the furthest point. So this kind of completely destroys the algorithm. Now there are ways you can you can fix it. This k-means plus plus algorithm kind of fixes this. You could also say maybe grab a few more cluster centers and and then you grab the outlier, but you also grab the right cluster centers. And so just thinking about what the effect of these outliers are going to be, you know, is, 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 a, is a more important thing than actually kind of coming up with a, you know, a solves-all, you know, solution of, of, of trying to deal with it. But, so, given that we have outliers, today I'm going to try and talk about um, three kind of general techniques of, um, of um, 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 of how to deal with them. So the first one will be to um, find and remove um, um, the outliers, right? So it's the obvious thing to do if you are dealing with data by hand and you small enough that you can look at it and plot it. This is most likely what people do. They usually, if they see they have some data point which is crazy, they're just going to throw this out. Often, right? Um, so this is what, but you know, the what is people have have done for many years, and usually they did, and they didn't tell you, um, and they didn't tell you that they actually did. It. You know, they just kind of did this. Um, the the third one is going to um, is going to talk about um, techniques. Um, uh, which are resistant um, to outliers. And we've kind of talked about some of these in, in different aspects of the class already. Um, and a lot of cool data mining algorithms are the ones which are um, resistant to outliers. So I'll kind of, kind of uh, remind you what these are and try and formalize some of the properties that they have. And so then there's some, and neither of these is always right, and then there's some techniques in in the middle, um, which apply in certain in, in certain situations, um, density um, based approaches, um, and so in certain very high dimensional settings or certain types of data, it's hard to understand what's meant by density. So these won't be 
um, completely general or as general as, as these other um, um, techniques or ideas. Um, so, I'll, so I'll kind of go through, through these approaches. And I, you know, I kind of, th this is again like the lecture on Wednesday. I've got a set of topics I'm, I'm, I have planned to talk about, kind of structured in the order I think they're, they're important for me to talk about them. But, you know, there's, there's lots of different ways of viewing and thinking about these problems. So if you have questions along the way, you have, you know, if you get me off on a tangent about something, uh, um, today's a good day for that, right? I don't, there's not some core thing that is, that, um, that I, um, that I, I think I really need to talk about, except maybe I should go over the, the first part of it, so. The outliers are often they often occur because you don't have as many like dimensions, like the features as you could. Like if you had more features, then that would explain the outliers. Um. So I, I think so. As I mentioned on on Wednesday, there I, I I kind of think of classifying outliers as as in the, these, these worst case outliers that you want to try and ignore and remove are things where you measured something usually incorrectly, or you didn't measure what you think you were, what you thought you were measuring, like you measured fish instead of the bottom of the ocean floor, right? These, these sorts of things. Um, so that, now the question, does this have to do with really, really high dimensions? So I think actually the, I think actually the opposite is true. So when you start measuring really high dimensional data, what's, what happens is you're measuring lots of different attributes and data actually is very heterogeneous. It means, heterogeneous means it has, you know, it's measuring lots of different things which are not, not necessarily compatible with each other. Like, like I might be compare one person who's on Facebook, someone else who's on Twitter, right? They have different sorts of data but they both have a social network that connects them. And maybe they they have friends who are on both uh, Twitter and Facebook that, that connects them. There's something so 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 there, you measure different things in, in different data, and so this kind of contributes to a higher dimensional space. But some of the dimensions aren't measured, and so so sometimes when you're measuring these these higher dimensional things, what's happening is that you're seeing different aspects of the individual. Uh, um, of, of, of the individual data points. And, and a lot of people in particular have very, have very personalized views of the world. It's hard to really well classify people into a small number of groups. You know, everyone wants to be their own person. Um, and so when you start measuring in higher dimensions, you probably end up finding even more outliers uh, for the same amount of data that you would have if you had had only measured a smaller number of dimensions. Um, so, so, for instance, if you look at if you look at a really so, so let's say that um, so who, um, so who's heard of manifold learning? This is kind of a buzzword that was really popular like five years ago. So so this people have heard of so even few people have heard of this buzzword. Okay, so let me so the. The idea is that you've, you've got this data which is living in this high dimensional space. And, and so there's some, and, and you think that there, there's some way that this data is representing by some, some manifold. And a manifold is something that locally looks like it's a lower dimensional space. But it's not necessarily flat, right? It's not necessarily a linear subspace, but there's some subspace that goes through there. Yeah. Manifold is, is a technical topological, you know, term that means that everywhere it looks like it's it, it looks like it's flat if you look at a small enough region. But there's no reason that these spaces are actually manifold. But that's just the word that people use. So, the, 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 um, so then what what the idea is that there's this really high dimensional space here, um, and I can only draw it in two or try in three dimensions, but if it lives on this manifold, which is curving all around in space-time and whatever other ways you can think of higher dimensions, if you only looked at two of those dimensions, the ones I've drawn it at, it's still a manifold. It still has this nice structure. And probably the structure is even simpler in this lower dimension. 
So if this data really is high dimensional and lives on this manifold space, but you only measure two dimensions, the, the structure of it is going to be even simpler than if you had measured it in higher dimensions. So you start measuring higher dimensions, you need even more data to realize this more complex structure. We talked about cross-validation. You want to um, you want to know how complex you should, you should make your structure, and some of this has to do with how much data you have. The more data you have, it's possible to learn a more complicated structure. Um, so, so if you only look in two dimensions, the structure can't be too complicated uh, because you've taken out maybe some twists that happen in this other other dimension. So I think. Higher dimensions, you're actually more likely to get more outliers than you are if you are to look at lower dimensions. Um, but you know, it's it's possible there's there are also some other phenomena where if you did measure the higher dimensions, it would kind of explain some things. There are these notions of um, these latent variables. These are variables you haven't measured, and these variables are a small number that actually explain everything. And so this is kind of like this compressed sense that somebody talked about. There are false, a very small number of items which were non-zero. These may be the latent variables that you're trying to measure. And if you had measured exactly these things, it would have explained everything in your data set. You didn't know which ones to measure. So if, so, but without those, it looks like the data is really noisy. Now you can kind of recover them if you have enough data and so forth. But, but if you had measured those higher dimensions, um, then maybe you wouldn't have had enough items. So, you know, you can kind of see it that way as well. Um, okay. Uh, all right. So, and those are good questions. So these are these, these are good things. Um, okay. So let's look at the first one um, to find and remove outliers. So this is, you know, it is. So I'm going to describe a very general and maybe in retrospect very, uh, a very obvious procedure. And I've alluded to it several times in class, but hopefully I'll explain why I delayed until now to actually talk about this. So um, you, you, you can think of this in, in three steps. So in the first step, um, um, you're going to build a model M on P, and this P is your data, right? So you're building some model. This can be a set of cluster centers. This could be some some subspace which you learned, um, which you found by regression, or some you know, or by um, you know, doing PCA or something. So this is some model on your data. Um, so the second step is for each data point in your data set. Um, um, you're going to find or you're going to calculate um, calculate um, um, a residual, which is R of P, which is somehow going to be um, some distance between the model and and the point. So the sum point on the model. So this could be if you have your data point here and you project this is P, then this is M of P, and this whole line here is the model. So and then this distance between here and here is the residual. So you're going to find this for each of the points. Um, and so then what you do is if RP is too big, um, um, remove P. Okay? Um, so this is very simple. Um, the, the idea, you, you need to use one of the many techniques we've talked about to try and build some model of your data. Then if you find, so then for each data point, you're going to calculate this distance to, um, to the model using some distance function we've talked about and using some way of mapping the point to the to the onto the model. So we could have instead have used the technique for regression and used this distance instead. Then this would be the residual instead of, of this distance. Um, 
So, so there's some variability in here. And then if the residual is too big, uh, then you remove it. Okay, so this seems like an obvious, so this, this may seem like an, an obvious thing to do. So. Do we want to remake our model then? Once All right, remake. good, good. Um, so, so after we do this, this model may have been skewed. It may have been that we didn't have this model. We actually had a model that looked like this instead, and it was drawn from this outlier. Once we've removed this point, then now, then the model will actually look like this black one, which goes through all the points. Right. So after you do this, you can then iterate by, um, you know, on on the new point set. Um, so, uh, so then we can iterate in a process where um, while outliers. Um, Find plus remove <coughs> outliers. Um, so from P to P prime, um, and then um, build um, on the model M of P prime. So find remove outliers. So this needs to take in. Yeah, right. So, so you, you probably want to do do this first or something, and then you keep repeating it while you have outliers. Um, so, um, so you can do this, right? So this this makes sense. But when you do this, you have to be kind of the, the, you have to be conscious conscious about a few things, right? So um, one is that it could be that. Um, because you chose, you built this model initially, you also classified some point up here as also being an outlier, because this one was too far away from the model. Um, so, so maybe you don't want to actually, um, like, you don't want to actually remove all outliers, or maybe something you remove, you want to allow it to be put back in after you've built a new model. You have to kind of think about these things. Um, you also need to be careful about how you're deciding to remove um, these points as being outliers. Right? So how do you determine which ones are too big and which ones to remove? And, and also, if you're looking at building this model, if the model you built because of the outliers was, was not a good model in the first place, um, then you're not going to be able to identify which ones are outliers. And you could throw away points which are not outliers. You could keep points which are outliers. For, for instance, if you ran uh, the Gonzales algorithm for clustering, you always pick the furthest away point. This may have included one of, one of the outliers. Then if you look at this residual, right, this residual may have been the distance to the closest center. Well, that point, which was an outlier, was chosen as a center, so this residual is then zero. So then you didn't actually, you know, um, throw away this out. So you haven't, you know, found out a way to discard this. So, so this, so if your if your model itself is not robust outliers, you're um, you're not going to, you know, you you might not be able to find the outliers to, to filter out, which is the whole point of doing this, right? So so this process seems seems very 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 simple, and intuitive, but there are lots of ways um, you can get into trouble with this. Um, so you, you need to be careful about these different things, and this is going to be very problem specific. So I can write it down like this in general, and this works for many of the different kind of scenarios we, we've, we've talked about in class so far. Um, but each of them was going to require a different way if you're going to actually get this to work somehow. Um, so, so for instance, if you're looking at clustering, right? If you if you ran the Gonzales algorithm, the model is going to is going to kind of is going to put the outliers into the model. It's not going to go go well. So you could run the k means plus the k means plus plus algorithm, and this will sometimes find the outliers, but sometimes not. And then you can say. And then you can calculate the residual after many runs of something like the um, maybe the average cost or the, the median cost 
of the distance from that point to the to one of the centers. And if it's usually small, it's not an outlier. But if it's if it's sometimes large, then maybe it is an outlier. And you know, it's not clear what what the right way to do here. What the right thing to do is it may different ways of tweaking this may work better for different data sets. This is not you know a, a, like a one technique solves all problems, but some some version of this might might actually solve your problem. Um, and so, in, in general, when you're doing this this old school technique where you where you look at your data as it's coming in and you recognize something as far off, you're probably doing something like this in your head, right? You're, you're probably kind of doing something, and you're probably saying, "Oh, the data all looks like this. This point is far from what I thought the data was looked like. I'm going to classify an outline or just ignore it." So, but it's important to be careful when you're doing this. Um, let me comment a bit more on this third step, right? One way of choosing if data is too big, so, um, so let's uh, blow this up a little bit, right? So, so, so one way of choosing if this data is too big is to say the, the, um, the largest 1% of residuals are outliers. Okay. Um, so if we did this for this step three here, what could possibly go wrong? Well, in the hundred, they still look pretty common. Okay, but you know, if if we really, if we have, if we have, if we have a million, uh, if we have a million data points. If the model is a really core structure that is captures, you know, more than 99%, if you threw away some things which were actually inliers, which were not outliers, you should still be able to get the structure. So being a little bit conservative, you know, should not be too bad. You should still be able to find the structure. But yeah, so so but if you're if you're talking about a 1% thing, say it's uh, in certain cases this 1% is going to be too large. You need something like um, one one hundred to one percent or something even smaller. You have more than one percent of your points are outliers. Um, yeah, right. So if you had more than one percent outliers, right, then then these could still throw your model off. But hopefully, what's going to happen is you're going to pump it into here, and you're going to then build a new model which will be more accurate. And then you can find or remove outliers again. Um, and so then this your model will eventually iterate towards something which is more accurate. Um, so the, so that um, but that could still be a problem if there's more than this one percent. Does, does that does that assume that like we take a model the way it is and we say okay one percent are outliers then we're going to find out what the distance is? Do we can we like reverse engineer it that way or is it? Well, yeah, so this, so any percentage, there's kind of this dual thing, like with the ridge regression between the S and the T. For every percentage of things that are outliers, that corresponds to a maximum distance, which if you're above this, that is, then you're an outlier. And if you just look at, you know, you sort all the distances, look at the 1% um, the, the of the largest ones, th that defines your, your, uh, your cutoff. But it's still essentially going to grab the same set of outliers, so it's not going to do anything different in respect to this outlier. Okay, so one of the things I mentioned is if we plug this into this this thing where we iterate, right? So if we always find the top one percent of outliers, then when is this algorithm going to stop? So you're, every time, there's always a top 1%, right? Yeah, so there's, you know, if, if, I, if I take this room and I say, um, you know, um, so, so I'm going to start it and say, who's, who's got the lowest grade in the class? And I'm going to say, this person, I'm, uh, um, I'm going to kick this person out of class. Uh, so don't worry, I won't actually do this, right? But then I'll say, 
okay, I kicked this person out of class, and now let's say who's, who's got the lowest grade, I'm going to kick that person out of class. But eventually, everyone is kicked out of class. Um, and I don't have to do any more work. <laughs> but, but I had a really, you know, I did, it didn't actually tell me when to stop. Right? So, you, you know, you can't blindly do something like this 1%. In addition to these other things, it may not be the right percentage, but if it's close, it may still get you the structure. But if you just plug it in here, um, like, like this, you could get into trouble. You have to kind of be careful when you're plugging it into some process that you're iterates. And there are a lot of algorithms that are do something like take the top k where they specify something like 10 points, the top 10 residuals, and throw those out. Um, or they top, take the top 1% and they throw those out. Um, but if you take those and put them in, in, inside here, it's going to be it's going to be a problem. Um, so it's, it's just something to think about. All right. So here's here's another strange case where you want to remove the top outlines, right? So let's look at points which are drawn from a Gaussian distribution, right? So I can try and draw so this is like a one-dimensional Gaussian, right? And so you're going to have all of P is drawn from the Gaussian, which looks like E to the minus, um, say, the distance from, let's say, or this is the mean of the distribution to the point squared, right? So it looks something like this. So this is, is, is the mean, right? And all the data points are lying along here somewhere. And there are many more in the middle. Um, and as it goes, it's going to you know, keep decreasing. And I'm exponentially less likely to get something further away from the mean. And as I go further out, the probability of having a point in here goes, goes down exponentially. Okay, so that's you know, a basic Gaussian uh, distribution here. Okay, so now let's say my data is distributed like this, and a lot of data that is not, say, something like age, which must be above zero or something. If you look at, um, um, I don't know, like if you look at, I don't know if this is the right distribution. But on top of my head, like if you're if 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 you're if you're gambling, the amount of of money that you want could be negative. It could be positive, right? Um, so if if this was your your distribution on the data, right, it, it's very likely to be a Gaussian, right? If you take a lot of random events and that are independent, then this then based on the um, central limit theorem. And they're drawn, uh, they're identical. Then, then they're going to look like they're from a Gaussian distribution at s, at some amount of cubic um, So, so data often looks like a Gaussian distribution. Okay. So now, now we could take something like the top one percent of these data away from the mean, and let's say we, where our model is going to be the mean point. And so, let's say. Or there are other ways you could build a model on this, but let's say a typical thing would be that the model is the mean and the residual is the distance to the mean. Okay, so now I could say let's take away um, outliers um, are equal to the um, the distance p minus mu is greater than one standard deviation. Right? I can take the standard deviation, and if I do this, then one standard deviation is going to be here, and this is going to be equal to about one third of all points are going to be outliers. So maybe one standard deviation wasn't the right thing. Let's say instead that I use two standard deviation. Right? Then basically one out of 20 points is going to be an outlier. Okay, or you know, if, if I chose three standard deviations, um, then it's going to be about one out of um, um, one out of three hundred points, right? Or even you know, I could say um, four standard deviations and it's one out of I think sixteen hundred points, something like that, right? So it's if I go more standard deviations out, I'm going to get fewer and fewer points, right? Okay, but 
maybe these points were generated from this Gaussian distribution. This is the actual model of the data. If instead of saying the distance to the mean, I say how likely are they in the Gaussian distribution, I'm going to get, I'm going to sort them in the same way. Right? I'm going to sort them. The distance to the mean is is going to be something that is um, is monotonic with the likelihood that they're generated from this distribution. So even if you did some more Bayesian approach where you talked about the likelihood of the data to the model, you're going to get the same sorted order for all, all the points. Or maybe you choose the mean differently that way, but you know, up to up to some, you know, up to some small error, it's about the same. So which of the points are which is the right cutoff here for choosing outliers? Yeah, Jeff? Three. So, so, so three is the right cutoff, right? So I, I took three standard deviations, which is you know out, out here, let's say. Right? And I've got this one point which is past three standard deviations. Is, is that point outlier or is it? So it's still, but it was still part of the data. It still fits this model, right? If I if I took data past this, then my data is not from a Gaussian anymore, but it's from some sort of Gaussian truncated at three standard deviations, right? Sometimes things that look like the noise are a natural part of the model, and so when you're trying to find some cutoff. There's no right cutoff. Either. There's no point at which this is an outlier. This is not an outlier. Um, you know, this is part of the model. This is not part of the model. It's just your model is not um, describing this. So one thing you can do is you can say um, that your data is this is the mean, and then there is some some uh, some uh, um, th th there is some uh, uh, some noise associated with this on top of it. There is this Gaussian noise on top of this mean value, which you're, which you're trying to find. So, um, so really, a thing is a data point is an outlier if it is keeping you from from building your model correctly. Yeah. Wouldn't it depend on what you're trying to study? For example, if you're trying to look at the average or the general thing where you have more volume and then you want to study the center of it and then you can like discard two sigma or something because you worry uh, you're studying the concentration. But 